Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks, Mark, uh, for this wonderful introduction. I did have privilege to speak here uh, on several occasions, uh, not to say on many occasions already. And every time Mark introduces me, it gets better and better. Uh, it's uh, probably due to the age. Anyway, uh, they always say it's uh, tricky to, to be the first uh, speaker after the lunch break, but uh, I see in your faces, in your eyes, that you are fit for work, and uh, it, uh, it gives me uh, additional courage. Uh, whenever we, we try to choose a topic, uh, it's, uh, let's say something about uh, culture and something about diplomacy. That's what culture diplomacy is about. But uh, it's a rather vague topic, so we always try to, to focus on something else. Nowadays, it was uh, particularly uh, difficult to choose the topic because, you know, uh, cultural diplomacy is, in fact, some soft politics, some soft measures. And uh, uh, we all, all are aware that there are really hard times for soft measures. But uh, we'll try to, to continue in a positive, in a, a very, very uh, affirmative manner. I'm not saying quite very much optimistic, but we'll try to put it in, in that context as well. Uh, we are all aware of the uh, security, political, and other aspects of the current situation around the world, and particularly Europe, Northern Africa, Middle East. Uh, that situation characterized by violence, by, by all kinds of uh, things that really don't contribute to the cultural diplomacy developments, uh, is in fact a political issue, is a military issue, is security issue. It really deals with many, many aspects uh, primarily. One of the consequences Europe is facing with, and my country uh, as well, is the refugee or refugee migrants crisis. That's how we call it. It uh, has uh, many layers. It's not only refugees. It's not only economic migration. It has really, really many facets of uh, the problem. Uh, we all are aware that practically the war is going on in the region that uh, there are efforts to, to find a political situation, that it uh, affects the whole region uh, economically. But here I would like to st uh, stress one thing, notwithstanding all the aspects that I just mentioned. It is also a cultural issue. A cultural issue because the refugees and the migrants are also a cultural effect. Why culture? Because we must take culture not only as art, not only as music, literature, painting, architecture, whatever, to take culture in the broadest possible sense, which means the way of living. Culture is the way we live. Culture is more than art. Culture is everything that uh, identifies us. Uh, we know that this crisis will be ultimately resolved by political means, and I hope diplomatic. It does not, unfortunately, exclude military means. But at the end of the day, it is all about integration of the people, integration of the cultures, and it is a culture issue. It will uh, require a diplomatic effort, so besides uh, other aspects that we mentioned, it is culture and diplomacy. And that's why I have chosen this topic culture, in, the, in the Conference of Culture Diplomacy in this institute. First, I'd like to, to stress this, what is going on, what we are witnessing is not the clash of civilizations. Definitely it is not. It is rather a meeting of the cultures. A meeting can be uh, sometimes tricky, can be painful, but uh, on the other hand, it offers the opportunities. If we see it in a positive way, 
I'm sure it will bring us to the resolution. Uh, I think that this approach, this aspect, is uh, partly something that uh, the organization called uh, Alliance of Civilizations deals with. It is a question more for my good, good friend Nasir Al Nasir, who chairs this uh, organization for many years. Uh, we know that Europe, Croatia as one of the countries particularly, have shown extremely big empathy towards the stream of uh, refugees that come from this region to Syria, Iraq first and foremost, uh, to, towards the Western and Northern Europe. Croatia is uh, a transit card country. Uh, we have had only in Germany about a million refugees and migrants this year only. Uh, over 500,000 passed through Croatia, which means from Turkey, Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Austria, Germany. Uh, before they, they took their uh, uh, trip through Hungary as well, but since the Hungarian government decided to, to uh, build a fence, which we don't approve of course, the stream of migrants went through my country. So over half a million. Uh, as long as they are in the transit, they don't stay, they don't uh, ask for asylum, they don't ask for any kind of specific protection. 99% of them want to end up here, where we are, in Germany, some of them in Scandinavian countries, but basically Germany is the, the destination. Uh, what was the attitude of uh, people in Croatia? Positive, very positive, for several reasons. First and foremost, 25 years ago, my country was a victim of war, of the aggression, and we did have, as a small country, 4.3 million people. We did have internally displaced persons, we did have refugees, we did have refugees from Bosnia and Herzegovina, from neighboring countries, almost one million which is over 20% of the population. And we handle them in a very, very good way. We know how, uh, what the problems are. We know how to handle these people. They were one of us. So uh, now when we see the people who really need help, the people still remember how some other countries helped us, including Germany, and how much it meant for us. So the attitude of the population is positive. No division. They come from there. There are other religions. There are other culture. No. It was really, really nice, nice to see. But uh, they come to Germany. They come to, to Northern Europe. And uh, it is the fact that these people will, these will represent their culture and they will have to live together, which means not visiting only as students, as tourists, they will have to live together. Uh, first generation, then second generation, children, they will have to, to mix up. Which means, what is required? Tolerance, first and foremost, on both sides. People who live here and people who come from the troublesome uh, uh, regions, they will have to show tolerance, mutual respect, patience. And. Uh, you know how it, how it works. When you come to some place, you show the respect to the host. You show the respect, be it as a tourist, be it as a student, be it as a work, foreign worker. You must show respect to the country that gave you shelter. And that's what is required. That eases the tensions. What is required from the uh, home population? To show empathy. And my feeling is that all around Europe, this empathy has been shown, in Germany particularly. I, I explained you that this empathy has been shown very much in Croatia, in my country. But uh, we are the transit country. Crucial is here. Now, uh, I said it is not the clash, but the meeting of cultures and civilizations. And what are the elements of this culture? Language, tradition, way of life, Communication, 
everything that is connected with culture in the broadest sense as a way of living. So the, the key element is how to preserve the identity without, uh, uh, and at the same time respecting the host. I think that is the way to, to the answer, the way to, to the resolution of all potential problems. We witness different attitudes in different countries. Even societies are split. If you have Poles, uh, not everybody is welcoming refugees or migrants, but it is still a majority. But you have countries also in Europe that where the minority would be in favor of uh, welcoming the refugees. Why is that? Different historical patterns, different attitudes, or the influence of a governmental uh, media or something else. Uh, every country has a different history. So we see the difference in the political attitude in past several months. I will not specifically uh, go into details because it falls beyond the topic. Uh, I will just mention that it is obvious that countries of Central Europe, of Western Europe, are more receptive towards the people in need than the countries that belong to the former Soviet bloc. But it also brings uh, uh, a risk, a risk of the race of populism. A, ra a race of populism, particularly right-wing uh, populism and extremism, which is fed on the animosity towards the different ones. And the flow of immigrants, the, the one million people who, who, who came all of the sudden, is a fertile soil for, for all kinds of extremisms. So uh, the answer is, again, mutual respect, tolerance, integration, learning the language, living together, and respecting each other. First and foremost, respecting the country where you came and respecting the people who came to your country. And there's no other way. There's no other way. Now, one, one uh, thing for the end. What are the concrete measures beyond this culture and diplomatic? Uh, you, uh, European Union does have certain institutional mechanisms. Mostly they failed, which means they were not well created. They were not created for such a crisis. They were not realistic, so they have to be adapted. Uh, we see that there was no vision and no mechanisms. Dublin mechanism obviously doesn't work. Uh, now, uh, who is leading these uh, European institutions? I was speaking here in the old building some years ago, and one of the topics was that Europe lacks leaders. It has followers. We have very few leaders. Uh, I think that the Chancellor Merkel is one of them. But most of them are not. And these institutions are run by bureaucrats. And that's why the population really doesn't have a feeling of the ownership of EU institutions, uh, which is not a, a good development. So uh, political, cultural engagement is necessary to have a soil of mutual respect and tolerance and living together. I could go on for hours like that. But I think I, I delivered the, the mo, uh, main messages I wanted to deliver. And I hope it was in a positive manner, because uh, it was a philo German philosopher who said, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. So it was uh, Nietzsche who said that. But uh, I really think that out of this crisis, we can all come together stronger and uh, with a better, better sense of knowing each other, respecting each other, and living together. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course, uh, should you have some questions, I think Mark will allow me.
though, is this is your chance for questions or comments. If you could briefly introduce yourself when posing the question, it would be excellent. The microphone is not so loud. We have another one there. Excellent. Please. I don't have to scream, right? Oh, good. Oh, good. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Ambassador. My name is Virginia Cutchin. I'm from uh, America. Um, I don't know the, exactly the appropriate time to ask this question, but I will because I haven't heard anyone mention it yet. So I hear a lot, we hear a lot about integration and tolerance and uh, uh, increasing awareness and, and, and all of which are very, very good, environmental sustainability, et cetera. I have not heard where we need to and want to, because I'm sure all of us do, integrate uh, animal welfare. And the treatment of animals, the, it, it, everything from the food industry to the entertainment industry, uh, et cetera. Because it was also a famous gentleman who said that you can, I'm paraphrasing, you can tell a lot by, of a country by the way its animals are treated. So um, my question to you, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I'm not an expert in that field, so uh, I could just give a general answer. Uh, Yes, this is also part of the attitude. I, I agree that you can measure the societies by the way they treat animals as well. But I cannot give you a more, more precise answer to that. I'm glad you agree. Thank you. Uh, I'm, Sil I'm Silvanos Malaho from Kenya. Um, I'm disturbed with a question in my mind. With this kind of uh, migration of uh, quite large number of people coming to Europe or so and so, is there an imagination that one time these people will go back to their country? Or is there an allocation where they are being given an opportunity of settling in Europe completely throughout? And if it is that they will settle in Europe throughout, what allocation is there for them to reserve their culture and their language and their traditions? Thank you. Uh, well, the future will show uh, how many people will be coming back once when the war and security situation will be resolved and how many will stay because you must be aware that not all the migrants are refugees. Some are coming just for a better life, which is legitimate. So those who find better life here will probably not very much likely come back. Now, how do they, how will they preserve their language, culture, and everything else? That is an issue that uh, in Europe, particularly in Germany, uh, has been an ongoing uh, issue for at least half a century, including my country, which is a country of emigration, we are 4.3 million and 4.5 living abroad. How do they uh, preserve the, the language and the culture? Case by case, but they do. Uh, generally speaking, the key is integrate in the society, but don't assimilate, at least not in the first generation. Because if you assimilate, you lose your identity. If you integrate, you respect the host but you preserve your own identity. How will it be in the second, third, fourth generation? This is a social process. We cannot influence it too much. But uh, case by case, you will, you will get the answer case by case. Thank you. My name is Ron Heiferman. I'm a professor emeritus of history at Yale University, probably the oldest still ambulatory professor emeritus. And I have a, the following question. Uh, you prefer not to talk about clash of civilizations as opposed to using the term meeting. But the reality is that in many countries, my own included, the United States, uh, there are uh, demagogues who are using these issues precisely for their political advantage. And it's not limited uh, to uh, the United States. The results of the recent uh, local elections in France, and there are other examples of this, so that while, yes, it would be nice to talk about meeting of the minds, 
or coming away. The reality is that uh, this notion of clash of civilization can lead to leadership, just the kind of leadership that uh, you suggest doesn't exist in Europe. But the question is, what kind of leaders? Uh, we've known from the past that fear has led to strong leadership with extraordinarily bad ends. Thank you for this question. It gives me opportunity to, to elaborate a bit, a bit uh, broader. Yes, I uh, deliberately uh, refuse to, to uh, accept the whole situation, which is not ongoing in the last 12 months. It's a much longer, longer uh, process as a clash of civilizations. Of course, we are all referring to Huntington's uh, book, uh, which is uh, disputed. There are people who really think that it is a marvelous book. There are people who really think it's a completely wrong approach. So I'm not going to open this debate. We are all aware of that. But when I said uh, the leaders in Europe, yes, of course, there are strong leaders, maybe uh, destructive leaders, as history shows. But I did put, and I want to emphasize it, the leaders in the context of the European Union. Because European Union is not structures, is not mechanisms. It is first and foremost ideas and values. We may argue with these values, but these values are threatened now. These values are freedom of movement, peace first and foremost, peace, peaceful uh, resolution of all the uh, clashes. So uh, these values are endangered. With the uh, extremism on all sides, with the uh, populism, we see the outcome of uh, some uh, elections. And uh, we will be having uh, elections in the next year or two, which may also be a setback. But the strong leaders, in the affirmative sense, strong leaders which, in the context of uh, European ideas, and these ideas are humanistic ideas, that's what, what we need. That's what we need. Not authoritarian or destructive. No, I fully agree with you. Thank you for opportunity to explain it. Your Excellency, we will need to conclude on that note, but thank you again so, so much for the uh, lecture and for the keynote address, for the questions, for your partnership in this conference, and also for your active role on the advisory board. If we could please join in expressing our sincere gratitude to His Excellency, Ambassador Ranko Vidovich. Thank you. All.